Hey everybody, welcome to Chuck Yates Needs a Job, the podcast from Darwin, Australia. And to be fair, until about six weeks ago, I didn't even know Darwin, Australia even existed. But we're cool enough to be hosted by Stephanie Berlin, Energy Club of the Northern Territory. Yeah, Chief Executive Officer. Nice. Thanks for having us. No worries. Thank you for joining us. So I don't even know where to start. What the, tell me everything I need to know yeah. about Australia, the energy business here, the Northern Territory. Wow, let's this start off crazy. with just the Northern Territory. Um, well, first of all, I'll tell you about Energy Club. So Energy Club NT, we're an industry association that um, connects the energy sector across Northern Territory. Um, our, we're basically funded or supported by industry um, as, well as, as well as government. But um, I guess our our main objective is to connect the energy industry across the Northern Territory. Um, And we do that everywhere from uh, our operators, explorers, down to um, the supply chain of anyone that services the um, the energy sector. So did you start this? No, I didn't. It was actually my predecessor, uh, Sonia Harvey, who's now uh, working with Empire Energy. Um, She started this uh, club in... 2015 so next year will be our 10th birthday nice so how did you get involved with it so i've been a member for of the energy club um since it's um since it started back in 2015 i think i'm like the 100th member i think so i was there back in the early days um and i've always just always been involved in 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 the energy club and um after COVID, time had kind of moved on. I think I was ready for something different and got um, tapped on the shoulder and invited to throw my hat in the ring for the CEO role, which I wasn't expecting. Um, but I got the role. So someone saw something in me that I obviously really didn't see in myself. And overnight, I became the chief executive officer of Energy Club NT. Exactly. Do you have like walk up music and stuff? Pomp and circumstance. You know what? I really want to start doing that at our events. And tonight you might see a little bit of that because I oh, think cool. it's really, you know, I think it's that, you know, good to have that vibe in our industry dinners that we hold quite often. So so, th- so what does the club do? Like what, what are we doing tonight? So what we're doing tonight is um, at our July industry dinner. So we have key industry dinners throughout the year where we invite um, a, a main speaker to come and talk about project opportunities, stories of, you know, or basically where, where they're from, what they do. Um, it's essentially sharing information. That's what we're all about, is sharing information around the energy sector in the Northern Territory, as well as opportunities um, and, you know, and any projects that are coming forward. Um, so we're really, exciting, uh, really excited to be hosting Brian Sheffield. This will be a second time we've had Brian. He's got an amazing story. You know, sequels story. always suck. The, do the, they? Se- the second movie is always <laughs> worse than the first. I don't know. I don't know. Brian's a great speaker. We we were pleased to have him um, this time last year, probably a little bit later in July, but a uh, great speaker. Everyone was really excited to hear from him. So looking forward to hearing from him again tonight. Yeah, that's going to be cool. Yeah. That, that is that is going to be cool. The uh, We've been tagging along with Brian for about the last week. Yep. So we've been all through the Northern Territory. We've learned way more about the Beetaloo Basin than we ever thought we would uh, know. That's uh, that's pretty exciting. How was your trip to the Beetaloo? The, it was uh, it was long. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, it was very arid, uh, very dry, very dusty. It looked like it looked like West Texas oil field. Yep. You know my um, my tennis pro when I grew up was Australian, and he used to always say that Texans and the Australians. Or kind of kindred spirits. Yeah. So yeah, it had a, I agree. I it, agree. Especially the Territorians. Exactly. So okay. So tell everybody what the Northern Territory is. So the Northern Territory is, I guess, as um, if we're talking to uh, people in the United States, we're a, a, a state of Australia, but we're actually not a state. We're a territory. So we uh, do operate a little bit differently to what a state would in Australia. We have um, two territories in Australia. We have the Australian Capital Territory and the Northern Territory. 
I won't go too much into the, I guess, the political side behind it and all that because I'm actually not 100% sure. So um, we do things differently here in the Territory. We're probably a little bit laid, more laid back than, than the norm. I come from Sydney, Australia. Um, very busy, very bustling place and the Territory is just a great place to come when you, I guess, want a, a sea change. It is quite, It is quiet, but when I say quiet, there's not as much as what a city has to offer, but it certainly is a different place to grow up, have raise your kids, get a, a job, get amazing jobs here in the Territory, Chuck. There we go. I, uh, <laughs> I, I should Great have job. brought my resume. With <laughs> There's a job for everyone and yeah. the opportunities are endless. And if you want to do something with yourself, the Territory is just the place to be. So what's in, what's energy like here? What do y'all do? Do you have oil and gas, LNG? Yeah, we've got, that? yeah, so LNG, uh, oil, uh, oil and gas. Um, we um, are seeing some developments around carbon capture and storage as well as hydrogen. We're also seeing developments uh, in solar farms as well. So um, Sun Cable are one of our uh, members and they're building a, um, oh, probably don't quote me, but a, a, a huge large scale, I'll just say large scale, I won't go into megawatts and gigawatts because I might stuff that one up. Um, but a, a I very ever, large scale. I can't scale. ever get electricity right. I'm always kilowatts, gigawatts, <laughs> megawatts. What was it? There's yeah. a huge difference, but yeah. I don't want to quote anything that might get me into trouble. Um, but a, a large scale um, solar farm, which will um, contribute to powering uh, Middle Arm, which Middle Arm is another massive project that's um, going to very much support the resources sector in the Northern Territory once it comes online. So... Wild facts I have learned while I've been here. The Northern Territory geographically is twice as big as the state of Texas. Right. And I'm looking at the map up there, but I'm just trying to see. Yeah, so so Texas is basically over there. Yep. And of the lower 48 states, Texas is the largest wow. state. Alaska is wow. our biggest state up there, but yep. half of it's ice and it's going to melt one day. Right. But... Um, Anyway, so the Northern Territory is twice the geographic size. Texas has maybe 27, 28 million people. Wow. What's the population of the Northern oh, Territory? Oh, again, I should have got my facts straight. I think it's about 120,000. I, I heard 250. In, in Dar oh, and, so and that Darwin. So probably across Northern Territory as a whole, you, you're probably right. And that Darwin's 000. like 150 of it. Yep. Yeah. Yep. yep. Oh, my God, that's yep. crazy. And, yeah, it's, it's a very remote and regional area. It is. The, the other wild thing that I didn't know before I got here is Darwin was actually the site of the second worst bombing attack in World War II in the Pacific Theater. Bigger, behind, than, bigger than Pearl Harbor. Oh, it was actually bigger than Pearl Harbor? A lot Pearl bigger Har than oh, Pearl cool. Harbor. Yeah, but it doesn't get any, you know, it's quite sad. I learned all about Pearl Harbor at school. Um, I even went to Pearl Harbor um, and learned so much about it and hardly knew anything about the Darwin bombing. And when I learned about it, it just blew me away. Like this harbour out here is massive, bigger than a Sydney harbour. Um, and you can only imagine the devastation it would have had on the people around this part of... And so was it, I mean, the Australian forces were just... This was a big base, and that's why it got uh, got bombed. What well, was it's kind the of top the of it's version. the top of Australia, so it would have been the first point of contact for the Japanese. Okay, mm. gotcha. Yep. The other so. wild, the other wild thing, because I went and walked along. Um, I heard it never got used, but during the war, they actually built a strategic reserve to hold oil yes. by drilling into the rock. Yes. Is that true? Yes. Yes, it's true. So if you um, if you get time, head down to the Esplanade um, at the waterfront there, and there's the old oil tunnels that you can go through that they built um, where they used to wheel the the oil through. So there is a there is actually old oil um, stations down near the convention centre. Um, I don't know if they I think they're they're tanks, um, and that's where they used to they did they drilled a hole through the tunnel uh, through the rock of the waterfront there, and that's where they used to pull their um their carts down full of oil i heard it was a, a mechanical engineering feat like just above possibly. anything yeah possibly i have it and to be honest i am i'm spooking about going i've never been to it myself so oh. but i should go down there I, I love war history although it upsets me sometimes but i still love it and i really should take the time to go and see what's in my own backyard 
Yeah, you know, it's been interesting. So I've been dating a, a British lady for over a couple of years now. And I was, you know, the height of Yankee arrogance, right? Oh, America came into World War II and we beat the Germans oh. and, you know, saved you guys. I went uh, when I was over in London to Churchill's war bank, uh, war room, where he was basically prosecuting the war underground, you know, because they were getting bombed every night. Yeah. And just what the, the the British went through in terms of being bombed, fighting back, mm -hmm. and all newfound respect. And the Australians made huge contributions to World yeah. War II yeah. as well. So Absolutely. the the uh, the Yankee is trying to show some humbleness <laughs> on a, <laughs> on, a, on that front. Yeah. So what's all the what's the LNG stuff up here? I mean, are these facilities that export LNG? Yes, absolutely. Yep. Oh, cool. So we've got um, the Santos Darwin LNG facility out at um, Middle Arm out there, and we've also got the Impex um, LNG facility. So the Santos DLNG facility is, uh, well, is it's coming to depletion now, but was receiving um, gas from uh, Bayou Andan, which is... Um, just towards uh, East Timor as you go north of Northern Territory. Um, so that was the processing, that's oh, it is the processing plant there. Um, and then Impex LNG um, receive their gas from their ICBIS um, FSP, FPSO, which is out more towards the west of Australia. Um, so yeah, big, big exports of LNG coming from Darwin. Massive yeah. contributions to the economy. No. jobs it's it's awesome so dlng are going through um some change at uh, santos dlng are going through some changes at the moment um so they're at end of life for bayou their bayou Andan field and will be uh, soon going moving online to the barossa uh, gas field which is more north of australia and heading more towards uh, east timor again so do we have capacity when our Beetaloo Basin comes in like a howitzer to, uh, <laughs> to export LNG and from there? Yes, well, I believe Tambor and Resources um, do uh, have some land allocated um, at the Middle Arm um, Precinct to have a LNG plant there too. But we certainly do have the room um, and the means. Um, however, if we're pumping lots of gas, I think we've got to hurry up and start building some more pipelines and, and facilities. You know, it's been wild as uh, Brian's been uh, been talking up how much cheaper it is to get LNG from Australia to Southeast Asia and Japan than from the United States. It's forty percent right. cheaper. What? Yeah. Well, there you go. There you so go. So we in competition with each other now, or? Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, when a, <laughs> when an LNG barrel gets on a ship, yeah, they're all competing with each other. Yeah. And, you know, time to time to market is ultimately money. So, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's going to be very exciting when the Beetaloo comes online. That's for sure. Yeah. No, the uh, it's you know it's crazy. So we've been hearing all these stories about the uh, the Beetaloo. Uh, they drilled so Origin originally owned it at one point, and they drilled a well, and the casing got stuck. So they just left the well bore there through the wet season oh. for call it, you know, six to nine months. And then they come back and they somehow get a piece of casing into the hole somehow. And they were able to get it producing and it made a million, it made one cu million cubic feet of gas a day, one, you know, and for about 90 straight days. Wow. And when they actually ran a log on it, it was, you know, the the heel of the of the lateral was the only thing contributing but it's it's if if they hadn't have produced it you wouldn't know whether there's gas or not there no that's right so it's got all those great stories yep. of the the other great story we heard about that well is they were literally literally drilling it and they shot a log and literally within 24 hours decided which formation to go horizontal in. I mean, most of the time, right, you're plotting that well in advance. We're going to go here. They were like, screw it, that one. <laughs> okay. Isn't that amazing? 
Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure that environmentally environmental approvals were all sought before they did anything like that. <laughs> I probably shouldn't do that. No, Maybe. we don't need to talk about it. We'll edit it. <laughs> Who knows? Nobody's gonna, yeah. nobody's gonna watch it. No. I don't know. After tonight, after our big party. Yes. Oh. Yes. After our big party, right. it's gonna be a big one. All right. So, what else do I need to know about the energy business in Australia? Well, there's lots to know, but I'm just a little bit caught off guard. Um, hey, we come dump this on your big party day. Yeah, no. <laughs> oh, by the way, Steph, can, we, to... can we record a podcast? Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's okay. Um, I mean, look, there's there's a lot of exciting things. Um, you know, I think we, you know, Energy Club NT, we we represent uh, members across the whole energy sector. Um, we're not just about all about oil and gas. Um, Gas is 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 the transitional fuel. It's it's the fuel of the future. It's cleaner than coal, um, and it's going to is certainly help us go through this transition. So, um, it you know we're obviously big supporters of the gas industry, but also as well we have our renewables partners um, with exciting projects that are really going to uh, you know as a collective the the energy sector are really going to meet our net zero targets and offer a better cleaner future when it comes to energy i mean we've rolled over in the united states and have been reducing emissions and it was all for swapping out coal uh natural gas for coal yeah i mean it it's 60 percent better yeah uh yeah well see northern territory is already at the forefront all of our power stations are all powered by natural gas not by coal unlike some of the other australian um states or well, other states in australia we um, are basically our jurisdiction. Um, we're self-sufficient. We don't rely on um, you know other states to deliver our gas. We're all very self-sufficient in our own backyard. Um, but all our power stations are powered by uh, natural gas. You know what else was crazy that I uh, I learned about is the Australian government is the only government to put a ban in place on fracking wells. And then lift that band. Really? It ban. It's never happened anywhere else. Is that the Australian government? Was it the Australian yeah, government? Yeah, possibly. That, that... So, but the Northern Territory government was the one that put the moratorium okay, so on was... on the fracking in the Northern Territory. So okay. we did. I think that was about six years, or I don't know. It was a significant amount of time. Right. Um, and then. Basically, uh, it sat through, um, you know, an inquiry process and then these recommendations came out of the inquiry, which have all been approved by government to move forward. Um, and now it's back online. So it could be the Northern Territory government. That was um, it then. Yeah. It's the only government on the planet to it, have ever it reinstated. It doesn't, doesn't surprise me, but I won't go into too much detail on that either. Cause it's We've got the recorded. state of New York in America that's uh, that's still banning it and you look around the world, but yeah. Yeah. Kudos to you guys. Yeah, well, it's, yeah, uh, great input by the government itself and also industry as well to, to get to where we are now. Are the politics kind of the same as in the United States? You have environmentalists protesting and don't try we ever. To, uh, okay. <laughs> don't we ever? Um, yes, we do. Yes, we do have some people who are for and very much against too. Um, and these people that are against do make life pretty hard for industry um, yeah. and progress in general. Have y'all had any luck? in terms of changing public opinion in the favor of, of energy? Because we have not done a very good job in the United States. Quite frankly, we just suck at it. Yeah. yeah. Look, I think industry, um, it, it is definitely a very important um, aspect of social license to ensure that you know anyone that's operating in the Northern Territory maintains that social license and shares information with community. As far as persuading, um, I guess, or changing perceptions of the gas industry is, has been quite hard and it is something that we could do do better as well as, as a collective and that's industry, that's also government, the regulators, um, to come together and, and start building that community um, knowledge because mis, misinformation in this town is terrible, really terrible. Um, so we do work, there's a few of us in some industry associations like the Energy Club, but that operate in mining and also um, um, Australian energy producers. Um, we work together pretty hard to, um, you know, address what these, you know, misconceptions are and 
what we could do better out in the community to, you know, share this information and educate. I think that's that's what it comes down to is education and sharing the correct scientific information, not the crap you know, that you see on TikTok and Facebook. You know, because at the end of the day, the bottom line is when you as a society stop burning wood and dung <laughs> in your house for heat and for cooking and you start burning hydrocarbons hmm. and using electricity, yep. your life expectancy doubles. Correct. You yep. know? And so does the pollution levels. Yeah. You know, burning rubbish and dung <laughs> um, is I didn't not say healthy. shit. I, I know, I well done, dung. well done. Yeah, <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think, you know, uh, you know, even if we were just to change, and I've just, I'm reading a, a book at the moment uh, for Liberty Energy, actually, from Liberty Energy. Yeah, about, Chris Wright about, does a nice job. Yeah, about, um, you know, about the, the energy poverty um, situation. It's interesting read. And I think, you know, just remo moving, removing that and even just transitioning to gas, it's already a massive change in itself. Yeah. Huge change. Because I truly believe this, and I'm, you know, I'm flipping a lot, but I'll, I'll be serious for just a second. If we, the Western world, go to Africa and Southeast Asia and we say, guys, you don't get to use cheap coal, you don't get to use natural gas, you're going to have to use solar and wind to power your economies, i.e. let them eat cake, wars start over stuff like this. Mm. I mean, that is not going to be an acceptable outcome. And so... not. Yeah, that's right. That's why gas is the transitional fuel, yeah. in my opinion. Um, so it's, yeah, but I mean, it's even just to do, to offer, even if we were to go to those places and offer um, wind and solar, there's so much infrastructure behind that that needs to happen as well. Yeah. You know, who's going to build those wind farms? Who's, how are those solar panels going to get built? They need critical minerals to, to make those, um, to make those machine, what yeah. do you call it? The, tech, the technology or the, oh, the, the infrastructure for, for yeah. that. Um, and also, you know, it, and it's going to need, they're hard to, it's hard to obey industries as well. So where's the power going to come from? It's not going to yeah. come from the solar panels we're trying to build. It's going to come from gas. Yeah. No, that's. that's so a it's a vicious cycle. And the only people we can blame is our ancestors and ourselves. We're the ones that put ourselves in this position. So we all need to work together to get through it. Yeah. As far as I'm concerned. Okay. So tonight. Yes. What do I need to know about? Because you're going to let me talk for I, what eight minutes? Eight minutes. You're going to let me talk for eight minutes. Yes. What do I need to know? Um. So Terry. Well, let me cut you off though, real quick. Last time I spoke to the Petroleum Alliance of Oklahoma. Yeah. They had a lunch of 500 people. I wore a T-shirt that said "IP in pools." <laughs> Can I wear that tonight? Cuss word on my shirt or not? P? P is not a cuss word. No, I have t-shirts with uh, cuss words all Oh, okay. okay. All right. Well, it, look, it's completely up, up to you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think... I see, I see you on yourself. And please uninvite like, <laughs> Chuck or can we, can we get the mic? All right. So what do yeah. I need to know? Okay, prep, so prep I mean, for look, this. so the, the audience is um, government, um, industry, stakeholders, uh, members, um, and we have a couple of other uh, stakeholders from, the, from Darwin attending. Um, Darwin's a pretty laid back place. So yeah. I think they might see a bit of humor in IP and pools. And most of us have a pool in our backyard because it is pretty hot here. <laughs> um, so look, everyone is quite laid back. Um, but, you know, everyone's there to, to hear the great story um, of the Beedaloo and the progress that it's going to, you know, to make for the territory. Um, but I think you will definitely throw um, an awesome Break a uh, break in there um, right. to become the different different to the norm. Well, That's Stephanie, good. you were cool to come on. This was fun. Yeah, I'm thank like, you. I'm like having a blast running around Australia. This yeah. is great. Yep, yep. The, yep. Uh, Have you had any time to do anything exciting around the uh, around Darwin while you've been here? Uh, I went down and and saw the war memorial. Oh, you did? Yeah, I went and walked uh, by that. Took some pictures. That was pretty powerful. Yeah. Uh, powerful stuff. Dinner last night was good. Yes. We had Greek food. Yes. Of all things. Yes. Yeah. Lovely. Was, it was really. Yeah. And I bumped into you there as well. I know. You were two, yeah, ta you were that, two tables over and yeah, we were. 
is how I've, small Darwin is. I've heard rumors of tonight after um, after this big thing, there might be a bar that's going to host all of us. <laughs> yes. Is this true? Yes. Awesome. Yes, there is. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yep. I'm looking forward. No, Thanks for good. coming on. This was cool. No worries. Thank you. Um, hey, if folks want to learn more about the club website yep. stuff, how do you how yep. do they find it? Uh, www.energyclubnt.com.au. Nice. All right. We'll see you tonight. Yes. Thank you, Chuck. Looking forward to having you. And now on to our major sponsors and representative delivering a speech on behalf of D Digital Wildcatters. Chuck Yates is a self-proclaimed towering giant of the energy business. Chuck hosts two podcasts, the most influential and popular energy po podcast on the planet, Chuck Yates Needs a Job, and Digital Wildcatters, the BDE show, a weekly wrap-up of all things energy or for people who think Jim Cramer sucks. After graduating magna cum laude, nor did he like to party, from Rice University with a BA in political science and an MBA in finance and plenty of BS, Chuck joined the Houston office of Stevens, the Little Rock, Arkansas investment bank where he strove to do well, but not well enough to get promoted to Little Rock. After figuring out he was a really crappy investment banker, he moved to the principal side of the business for a private equity firm, firm who will not be named, where he fared not much better. But as anyone who has spent more than 30 seconds with Chuck Yates knows, he did the legendary Silver Hill deal. Chuck once won a bet from Superman where the loser had to wear his pants on the outside of their clothes. Despite all of these achievements in the, in the post-COVID spring of 2020, Chuck was shit-canned from his gig as managing partner, but did make it to the Wall Street Journal, so at least he had that going for him. Please, everyone, make him feel welcome as he joins us on stage, Chuck Yates. Give it up for Stephanie. This is a fucking awesome party. Stephanie actually recorded a podcast with me today at 1130 and the look of terror in her eyes, given that she's trying to pull this off tonight and I'm sitting there making her do a podcast. Kudos. One more big round of applause for Stephanie. Great. So there was a preacher and he had an 18 year old son. And he had spent his whole life trying to raise his son well. He was really worried about his son's future. What kind of man was he going to become? So he wanted to run a little test. So he went into his son's room, and on his son's dresser, he put some money down. He figured if the kid would come in and take the money, maybe he'd be a businessman. He put down a Playboy magazine. He figured if his son came in, looked at the Playboy, he'd be a no good degenerate philanderer and he'd at least know. He put down a bottle of Jack Daniels and he sat there and goes, well, if my son takes the Jack Daniels, he'd be a no good alcoholic. And then he put down a Bible and he said, maybe if he takes the Bible, he'll be a preacher like his dad. So the preacher goes and gets into the closet and kind of opens it up so he can see his son. His son comes bounding into the room. He sees the money. He grabs the money. He counts it, shoves it in his pocket. He picks up the Playboy magazine. He leaps all through it, looks at the centerfold, shoves it under his arm. He then takes the bottle of Jack Daniels and drinks the whole thing in one swig. Go, 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 go. Then puts the Bible under his arm and says, I'm going to go conquer the world and runs off. The preacher looks and is sitting there in the closet, looks up to God and says, oh Lord, help me, I'm raising a Texas oil man. <laughs> now I've now spent a week in the Northern Territory. I think I can give that punchline as I'm raising an Aussie oil man too. <laughs> Cause you guys seem like you're down with that too. So as Stephanie was saying, I ran a private equity fund for 20 years. And I did get fired in April of 2020. It was great. I got on the, uh, uh, a Zoom call because, you know, we're in the middle of COVID, right? And the CEO of the firm's like, well, Chuck, we need to let you go because of performance. 
And I was like, oil's at minus 37. And I'm pretty sure I didn't do that. But anyway, sure, guys, whatever you want to say. Uh, so anyway, I got booted. But the interesting thing, kind of on the reflection of that, the things we did when I was running the private equity fund is we did early stage assets. I mean, we would go in and we would literally drill the first horizontal well ever drilled in a county. We would use slick water fracks where they'd never been used before. One of our portfolio companies, Lyco, actually set off the Bakken play, which is a big oil play in uh, the north part of the United States. Um, we used to call our portfolio companies five guys in a rusty pickup truck because they're very entrepreneurial and the like. So I had a front seat to the American shale revolution. And it was an amazing thing to watch. And the one thing I want to bring to you guys is I have one, well, I got tons of regrets. Anyway, that's another thing. We'll do that in therapy later. But I have tons of, tons of regrets, but I have one really big regret going through the shale revolution. And I want to say it now, because you guys are about to go through something just amazing in the Beetaloo. Y'all are going to have a similar level of success, similar level of dynamic change that we saw in the American shale revolution. And I have one big regret. And so I wanted to share it with you guys. And I'm going to be serious for just a second. I really wish we had been proud of what we did. Think about it for just a second. I mean, we literally doubled oil production in the United States after decades of decline. Do you know how much easier it is to deal with OPEC when suddenly you have oil on your own? It was a lot easier, right? We literally changed geopolitical events in the world because of doubling oil. We doubled natural gas production in the United States. And the cheap energy that we provided to the US economy literally changed lives. I mean, we had an economic expansion from call it 2000 to today that probably is unparalleled in world history because of the cheap energy that we provided. And that spread across the world. And that's really important. And we should have been proud of that. We did a really, really good thing. I don't give a shit what anyone says. We did a really, really good thing. And if we step back as energy people, not just watching the shale revolution, but just step back. In 1950, literally 75% of the world's population lived in extreme poverty. And that's $2 a day of income or less. 75%. Any idea what it is today? Guesses? How, what percent? Somebody scream a number. 30. No, it's less than 10%. Less than 10% of the world today lives in extreme poverty. And that's because of everybody in this room. It's because of the energy business. It's because of the power of cheap energy, hydrocarbons, that, that basically allowed us to have economic growth because we could have machines do work for us that we used to have to do ourselves. And we should be really, really proud of it. There are 7 billion people on the planet today that do not live in extreme poverty. And all we hear from the media is, oh, things suck, it's so horrible, blah, it's so bad out of there. If I owned a newspaper, the headline today would read, 133,000 people today do not live in extreme poverty versus yesterday. That is how quickly we are getting rid of extreme poverty on the planet. And it's because of you guys. It's because of energy, cheap energy, power in the world. So I really wish I had been proud going through the, the shale revolution. Because at the end of the day, when you go from burning dung, I guess I can say shit, right? In Australia, I can say shit. Burning shit, 
and wood in your house for heat and for food, uh, for cooking, sorry. I've had three glasses of champagne. <laughs> Give me a fourth and God knows what will happen. But because we've gone from, when you go from shit, burning shit, burning wood, to burning hydrocarbons, your life expectancy doubles. And that's something we should all be really, really proud of. I mean, we did that. And so here's my ask of you guys. My ask of you guys is when you're proud of something, what do you do? When your kid wins a baseball game? Or I guess I should say cricket, right? By the way, will somebody tonight explain cricket to me? I mean, what it seems to me is it's like a three-day thing to go on a bender drinking. Is that basically cricket? Have I understood it? Five days. Holy shit. All right, I'll be at the bar. Somebody come to explain it. Okay, great. I want to figure that out. But when you're really proud of something, what do you do? You tell that story. You put pictures up. And that's what we as an industry don't do. That's why the environmentalists win. That's why the other side gets to dictate the narrative, right? Because when you're in a vacuum, what happens? Things expand. And if we don't tell our stories, guess what? We lose. So the fact that the environmentalists beat us up all the time, I hate to be a dickhead right now, but I'm going to go ahead and say it to you. We deserve that because we don't tell our stories. So everybody in this room, I want you to become a content creator. I'm serious about this. We all have an iPhone, don't we? We all have a smartphone. So we literally can create content. And when you think about creating content, you go, how do I start? Not everyone's as charming as you are, Chuck, and can be a wonderful podcast host and make great videos and all that. Come on, man, it's my head, it works. <laughs> start with documentation. People really think what we do is cool. I know you don't believe that, but literally, take your phone, turn it side, this is a pro tip, turn it sideways so that it's 16 by nine as opposed to this way. You do this way for, uh, for TikTok, this way for everything else. But just document what you do. The CEO of Digital Wildcatters, Colin McClellan, made a TikTok video about how a drill bit works. Two million people viewed that over two weeks. And yeah, there were some comments about, oh, you're destroying the world with hydrocarbons, blah, blah, blah. The vast majority of the content of the comments were, holy shit, that's really cool. I had no idea how that works. So if we will all do this and we will all create content, the power of social media and the internet literally means everybody on the planet can see this. I mean, if you think about it, I'm from Houston, Texas. I'm freaking Darwin talking to you guys. And that's because of the power of the, uh, of the, of the internet. So if we'll all do that, even if we get five likes, six likes on something, that's five or six likes we didn't have yesterday. And so I want us all to become content creators. I want us all to start with documentation. If you spill oil, if you're at a well site and you spill oil, document how you cleaned it up. People think that's really cool. The one, <laughs> the one thing I have not created a piece of content on yet, but it's my favorite story, so I'm working on this, so I'm gonna do this. One day I get a phone call from one of the companies I'm invested in. It's the CEO, and let's just call him Dave. Let's call him Dave Lenorman. Dave calls me. <laughs> Dave calls me and goes, Chuck, man, we got sued yesterday. And I went, oh my God, what did we get sued for? And he goes, well, the landowner claims that I impregnated his prize pig. And of course, I couldn't help myself, so my response was, well, is it true? <laughs> so we don't necessarily have to do that content when we do these things. But anyway, I want us all to create content because seriously, we all need to be proud of what we're doing for the world. So we're gonna do two things real quick. One, big, huge round of applause for you guys for providing energy to the world so people don't live in poverty. Give it up for yourselves.
it, it does suck that that was louder than the applause for me coming up here, but okay, I'll get over it. And then number two, can you play the, uh, the video? So this is literally if we do this stuff and we do it every day. What's going on? I heard the wildest rumor. Yeah. I heard big Texas oil man Brian Sheffield came here and tried to buy this place. I don't know about that, eh? And but you I told him Brian's to got, Yeah, he hadn't got enough money. <laughs> uh, U.S., eh? I love Tim, by the way. He's great. Last thing I'm going to say, and then I'm going to sit down and shut up because y'all all came to see Brian speak, not me. Um, one of the things we've done at Digital Wildcatters, we publish 10 podcasts. We do live events. We'll bring an energy tech night to Darwin. That's where we get a room like this. We get four or five technology companies come up, give product demos. We all drink too much beer, eat pizza, and then we all vote with audience applause and the winner will get a wrestling belt. So it's kind of like a WWE night, but it'll be fun. I'll work with Stephanie that will do it. The other thing we've got, and there's a QR code uh, for it. Seriously, go to our uh, Knowledge Share app, Collide. We've tried to build this as the community for the energy business. We have a forum where people can talk to each other. So think Twitter, LinkedIn, and all that. You guys in Australia, if you have stuff going on here, you got issues, go to Clyde and say, hey, Texans, hey, Oklahomans, have y'all ever dealt with this shit? Tell us about it so we can talk to each other. We've got 20,000 job listings on uh, Clyde. So if you want to come and get a new job, I'm not suggesting that, but come on over, check out the jobs. We also have a video search engine. So we actually used AI to train it to watch all our videos. So we have a very, very good search engine. It's very detailed. And we've got over 3,000 videos on energy, including all our podcasts. We've got guys sitting there in their kitchen doing science experiments. We have all sorts of stuff there. I go down the rabbit hole at night and watch this stuff all day. So love to have you guys playing around. Um, on that. And then the other thing we ha we've got, we call it tech companies. We've got 125 energy tech companies that all have landing pages there. They talk about their products. If they did product demos for us, came on our podcast, we've got links there. That's really cool. And then the other thing, the final thing we have is we have Collide GPT. So at some point, us podcast bros went, you know, we've got a lot of cool content. We should train an AI language model on it. So we did. So if you mess around with chat GPT and you ask it a question, if you ask Collide GPT an energy question, 80% of the time you'll get a much better answer because it's only trained on energy data and the like. And so I'd love to have you guys play around on Collide. And you guys have been a great audience. This is fucking cool. I love being in Australia. Thanks, guys.